if you come to the book of Revelation, we won't turn it up because you probably know this almost off by heart. The book of Revelation, of course, is a love letter from our beloved bridegroom to us. And in his letter of love, specifically the part that relates to us, he says, watch and faithfully wait. Here's what he said. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he. We pray that's us, brothers and sisters and young people. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garment, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Now, there can be no doubt that that relates to us because look at the next verse. And he gathered them together into a place called, in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. Well, we expect that to be very soon, don't we? So here we are, just before that time, he calls on us specially to watch. Now, you know, prophecy, some say, is not very important. They say it's the least important part of God's word because it's open to abuse and can't be completely relied on and so rather unnecessary to study. But think again. It is utterly important and it's best seen in the part of the down through the times in ages like ours. You see, Noah warned, was warned, wasn't he? He was warned in that time of iniquity, to build the ark. And the result was he saved his family. Remember Lot. Lot was called on to leave, to go out of, out of Sodom into the mountain. Four went. But three survived, as we remember. So because he responded, he saved some of his family. Same in the days of Jeremiah, when the Babylonians were about to take the city. He warned the good figs that they must go into captivity. And those that did, most of them were saved. And lastly, the Lord warned the brethren in, a, in the day in which he lived, AD 28 through to AD 30, to flee Jerusalem ultimately in AD 70. And of course, those who fled to Pella were saved. Well, here we are in a day very similar to that. And we have been warned with proph prophecy that the time is short. Well, let's look at it. Now, here's going to be the pattern we're going to be following most of the way tonight. We're going to be looking at Ezekiel 38. We're not going to turn it up because you know it pretty well. And it describes a massive invasion of the land of Israel by Russia and Europe and Iran, opposed by Britain and a young lions. Now, I want to look at that as our pattern most of the way tonight. Now, first of all, I want to look at the fact that it is going to be opposed by Britain. All right? So we're going to look, first of all, at Britain. Now, that came up in our reading. You know, Isaiah 23 that we looked at a few moments ago, not very often looked at. But it is quite critical because it's talking about Tarshish. It actually gives 10 titles for Tarshish. But the one that's used most is, of course, Tarshish. It's repeated four times. And what does it say? There? Well, look at verse 18, first of all. It's on the PowerPoint before us. And her merchandise and her hire shall be holiness to Yahweh. It shall not be treasured nor laid up. For her merchandise shall be for them that dwell before Yahweh, to eat sufficiently, for durable clothing. So it runs up to the time of Christ's return. Now come back one verse. And it shall come to pass at the end of 70 years that the Lord will visit Tyre. But notice it says in Isaiah 23 verse 17 that at the end, end of 70 years, Britain is going to finally prosper. The Lord will visit Tyre and she shall turn to a higher and shall commit fornication with all the kings, kingdoms of the world upon the face of the earth and her merchandise and her hire shall ultimately be holiness to the Lord. All right, now 
Remember that at the end of 70 years. Let's move ahead. Well, our brethren down through time, and I could have multiplied this probably 10 times, have spoken of the fact that Britain, yes, it will be allied to Europe, but it will not remain allied to Europe. Brother Thomas said in Help Us Israel, right at the beginning, Britain cannot be included amongst them. That's Europe. Brother Mansfield, H.P. Mansfield wrote in 1973, the crisis, and of course at that time they were joined with Europe, the crisis at the last days will drive her, Britain, from, from Europe. Brother Graham Pierce, 1981, said, Britain will separate from Europe. Well, what do we see? Well, at the close of the Second World War, Churchill, and I hope you can see him there on the left, planned to join Europe to stop another war. And in, in September 1946, he said, if we join up with Europe, we can moderate their behaviour and there won't be another war. Well, let's go to the end of 70 years. And in June 2016, they voted to leave their alliance with Europe. But when did they join Europe? Well, in May 1940, this is worth taking down. They joined the Council of Europe, and a month later, they joined NATO. And at the end of 70 years, they left. The beginning of this year, June 2020, they left. All right? Now, since that time, of course, they're negotiating with Europe to see what they can arrange. But they had determined to leave. The vote had gone through at the start of this year. And so they formally left. Well, what's going on now? Well, here we are. Look at the date. December, I don't know if you can see me pointing there, but December the 5th, 2020. Boris Johnson and Ursula van der Leyen agreed to a final crucial phone call. <laughs> Boris got on the phone and he sang uh, Walsing Matilda. He said, let's establish a deal with Europe the same as we have with Australia. Well, they wouldn't do it. Brexit deal in tatters. There we are, last Saturday. Now, here we are, a few days later on, Johnson's heads to Brussels. He's going to fly over in a desperate effort, a last-ditch trade talks. He went over and it looks like a failure. Major dishum... Agreements remain, they said. You know, it's even greater than that. You see, Scotland wanted to remain joined to EU. There's the Prime Minister of Scotland, Nicola, Nicola Sturgeon, and she wanted to remain joined to Europe. But Europe said, all right, you've got to change your currency. She said, I'm not going to. Well, they said, in which case you can't join. So Europe has told her that she can't be part of that EU. So all of Britain and part of Ireland, it would look like, will break away from Europe. Now, the final date is supposed to be December the 31st. But anyhow, there's where it is at the moment. Now, this little cartoon is really quite classic. You know what the scripture says? Britain's the liar. But look at the wording. No sign of doomsday as Britannia waves the rules. Doesn't rule the waves, waves the rules as he drives away from the EU. I think that's quite classic. Well, let's come back to where we were. Okay. The EU describes a massive invasion of the land of Israel opposed by Britain and the young lions. Now, let's have a look at the young lions. Well, here we are. The EU is disintegrating before our eyes, the British paper says. That's back in April. And the, here's Boris. And you know what Boris is doing? He's on the phone to Commonwealth countries. He's on the phone to the group called, and he's called it this, the Kenza Group, established this year, of Canada, Australia, New Zealand, United Kingdom. Okay? And so they're determined to unite with that group. What an amazing group. Let's embrace the Commonwealth instead, he said. Now, 
in the newspaper article, it didn't have that picture of the lion on the right-hand side there. I put that in because we know that well. There we are, World War I, and there's the young lions. Well, it's that again now. Okay, we're not Commonwealth countries under Britain, but we allied to Britain. And things are moving. And Britain is not just ally with us. The EU set the deadlines for last Sunday, and it's setting it again for this Sunday, Reuters says. Okay? Britain, EU set Sunday deadline to clinch the Brexit trade deal. And it doesn't look like it'll go through. But now if you have a careful look at that map, this is what Britain has been doing this year. It's been establishing trading alliances with all of those countries. Now, it hasn't gone through with every one of them, certainly the Commonwealth countries and India. India's not been shown there, but it's there. And all of those other countries, it's approaching them to form a new trading block, huge trading block. It's really incredible. Well, things are moving. But it's not just trade. Britain is also forming an alliance to defend themselves, so to speak. Here's an alliance where they share intelligence. And look who they are, Australia, New Zealand, Britain, Canada, and USA, to keep an eye on the world so they can understand what's going on, as well as Israel. Yes, they know where you can get real information. The Israelis, they're very good at their secret service. Well, let's move along. In Daniel chapter 12, it tells us that there shall be a time of trouble such as never was. And at that time, thy people, ourselves we play, shall be delivered. Every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust shall awake. So here we are at the time just before the resurrection, just before we're assembled to Sinai. He says it'll be a time of trouble such as never was. Well, that chapter that we looked at, that's Isaiah chapter 24. It's very interesting because it would appear that the Lord's mind is in that chapter when he wrote the Olivet Prophecy in Luke chapter 21. He alluded to it at least five times. Now, it's in the second half of the Olivet Prophecy that relates to the time period just prior to Christ's return, our time period. And so he talks about the earth in perplexity. Same words if you use in the Septuagint. In Isaiah 24, the sun and the moon, moon and the sun, in Isaiah 24. Fear and the earth, Isaiah 24. Drunkenness, drunkard, Isaiah 24. Snare and the earth, snare and the earth. See, the Lord is using this quote. This is where his mind is as he wrote that second half of the Olivet Prophecy. Now, Brother Thomas wrote in the ancient way back in the 1850s, he said, my readers will remember the quotation from Isaiah chapter 24 as to the earth being empty and waste, as to it being utterly broken down and clean dissolved and moved exceedingly. It would be well to read the whole chapter. <clears throat> well, we read half of it, didn't we? He says it speaks of judgment commencing, and then introduces this, that's Christ, glorious universal reign. You know, it ends with those beautiful words. I'll read you the final words of that chapter. And he says, Then the moon shall be confounded and the sun shamed, when Yahweh of hosts shall reign in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem before his ancients gloriously. Before us, we pray. Well, there it is. So Brother Thomas said, this is what we're talking about. Well, let's move on. Well, worldwide effects of the virus. Here we are today, yesterday. Actually, it was today on the web. Cases, 70 million worldwide has been experienced. Over a million deaths. New US cases, 194,000 in a day. And countries, 
220 countries in the world are experiencing that. Well, will it be resolved? Well, we don't know. But one thing's for sure, in Habakkuk chapter 3, it says this. It says, and I'll read it to you again. Aloha, talking of the saints, the mighty ones. It should be, shall come from Teman, which is the region of Sinai. And before him went pestilence and the plague. You've got to go into the margin for, to find that. This is a fiery disease in the King James. Follow at his heels. And again, in Zechariah 14, which speaks of the early stages of the kingdom, it talks of the plague being spreading through the world. Well, brethren and sisters, there appears to be a vaccination in Britain, but we have the true vaccination, immortality. We have the sure vaccination. Well, whether this is going to work, we'll see. The vaccination they're having over in Britain. But indeed, we have the true hope. What a wonderful prospect we have, brethren and sisters. Well, let's move ahead. Isaiah 24 also speaks of the earth being empty. That's strange. We read that. Verse 3, the land shall be utterly emptied and every house shut up so none can enter. Well, that's not Australia very much. Here's London. Picture March, one of the key streets in London. Eerie photo of London at rush hour. And here's one of the key streets in Adelaide. <laughs> with a kangaroo going up the street. <laughs> you know, for a while, Adelaide was very much in lockdown, wasn't it, too? But there we can see the scene. What an incredible scene. And that's exactly what Isaiah chapter 24 spoke about. Isn't that intriguing? And as well as that, brethren and sisters, Isaiah 24 speaks of, as with the maid, so with the mistress. Verse 2. As with the buyer, so with the seller. As with the lender, so with the borrower. As with the taker of usury, so with the giver of usury to him. And that's fascinating. Brother Sully <coughs> in the Ezekiel's temple says this, referring to that, he says, all confidence in the money market is gone. All stocks and shares worthless. No banks. Is that something to say? Shortly after Christ returns, so here's what they think next year might, might bring. Economic collapse. Well, who knows? But one thing's for sure, Brother Sully, about three pages before the end of Ezekiel's temple, spoke of the fact that there will be a major economic collapse that will take place shortly after we're taken. Well, he then also goes on to speak of the earth being twisted and the earth shaking. You know, this year has been a year of great earthquakes, mighty earthquakes going through the earth. Incredible. There was 1,500 1, earthquakes in three days in Iceland. The year started off with about 45 volcanoes, 55 now active volcanoes. There's been four earthquakes in Israel, one only a few days ago, not so much in Israel, but was felt in Israel. And in Idaho, a state in USA, in one week, there were 238 earthquakes. Indeed, that chapter is being fulfilled before our eyes. But let's come back to our pattern. It speaks to us also of the fact that Russia and Europe are going to unite and move into the Middle East. Well, first of all, Brother Thomas spoke of the fact that there will be a, 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 a diversion Something will divert the nation's attention away from the Middle East. Complications will doubtlessly arise in the West, which may divert the attention. What's diverting the attention? Well, here's one of them. China is a national security threat number one, says the Wall Street Journal. It's got the largest army in the world. It's huge. Even Russia isn't as big as that. And so here's China. It's worrying the nations. Here's America. <laughs> China now our biggest military threat. Not so much Russia. That's what they're thinking. China presents the biggest military threat to the United States. What about Australia? 
Scott Morrison says we're going to spend in the next few years $270 billion to arm ourselves better than we are now. That's huge. We're worried. Our attention is going away from Russia, but it shouldn't be. Here we are, okay, two years ago, Russia said they've got a bomb that's so big, drop one of those hydrogen bombs on France, we can wipe out the whole of France in one hit. It's incredible. Huge hydrogen bombs. And again, here we can see, now he is this year, Vladimir Putin's encirclement of Europe. Europe is being encircled by Russia. He is March this year. And it doesn't stop there. Okay, this article was a number of years ago, but it depicts the picture of what could happen. I don't know if an invasion is going to happen. I think Europe's just going to capitulate. But NATO's got an army of 200,000. Russia's got one nearly four times bigger. And that's not their call-ups. That's the standing army. So it's huge. But you see, we depend upon America. Take World War I. Who brought it to an end? America. <clears throat> World War II. America. <clears throat> and so what's the situation going to be? Well, brethren and sisters, America is now very muchly distracted. They are distracted by the huge numbers of people dying. Average seven-day seven average of 2,239. 200,000 cases, new coronavirus cases, not deaths, cases in a day. They're just shaking. They're not, their attention is no longer outside the country to the same degree it used to be. And so here in Britain, the risk of a new world war is real, says the head of the armed forces of Britain. There he's being interviewed. General Sir Nick Carter said, the problem of coronavirus could even lead to war. How serious is that? Well, Russia and China, September this year, had a massive Caucasus 2020 military exercise south of Russia in the area of what we call scripturally Tagama, Armenia, Belarus, Iran, in that area. More on that in a minute. Russia and the Western to jointly to avoid war. Relationships between Russia and NATO are at their lowest ebb since the end of the Cold War. Date, December the 8th, only a few days ago. There it is, NATO Russian ambassador warning them. And here's the diplomatic military experts warn that the West and Russia risk war, says Forbes magazine, only a few days ago. How long is it going to be? What's going to happen? Will Russia invade Europe or will it just simply capitulate? Well, here's a bit of a clue. This year, last year, late last year, Emmanuel Macron, a student of the Jesuit College, a Vatican champion, entertained Mr. Putin. There he is. And you know what he said to him? Here's the chance, Mr. Putin, for Russia to rebuild bridges, and he's referring towards Europe. So here we are. He's influenced possibly by the papacy. She's the leader of the EU and NATO, and she says, My aim is to set up a United States of Europe. A United States of Europe. That reminds us of the Ten Toes, doesn't it? And there's her aim. And here, only a few days ago, against America's wish, strong wish, they began Russia, this Russian ship there you can see on the right, came into the uh, waters around here and near Germany and began again to make the Nordic steam pipeline, stream pipeline, to finish it off. This pipeline will increase Europe's reliance on Russian gas. So the second pipeline's gone in against America's wish. Strong wish, 
strongly opposed by America. Well, things are moving dramatically, aren't they, brethren and sisters? And here's a cartoon classic, a really good one. See, here we can see a pipeline coming out of the water and sitting on it is Mrs. Merkel and on the other side, Mr. Putin. And it's if they're kissing. Yes, the US, there we are. Germany, in fact, has become Putin's lapdog in Europe. Putin is supplying the natural gas to Europe. And meanwhile, here's Mrs. Merkel waving a bill to Trump. The US sees no point in paying for the deployment of the US military on Germany's territory while Germany is purchasing significant amounts of Russian gas. In the last few weeks, tens of thousands of soldiers, American soldiers, were pulled out of Germany and put into Poland because of the situation going on there, that is in Germany. Well, things are changing also in Italy. Early in the piece this year, when first of all the coronavirus came, down, came into Britain, came into Italy, those planes you see on the left flew in from Russia. On board it, it had containers, containers containing ventilators, as well as that military vir virologist, medical teams coming in from Russia. And on the sides of the containers that had the words, from Russia with love. Russia sent all its possible aid to help Italy. And then Putin came and had a chat to the Italian Prime Minister. There they are speaking. And then having spoken to him, he went around to the corner to the shack behind. There it is. And he had his sixth visit to a Pope. Third one to this Pope. And there he spoke, what he spoke about, we don't know. We can guess because we know from scripture. Well, the papers are saying last year, late last year, the Vatican and the Russian Federation are united religiously. A new phase has begun, a close relations between the Russian Orthodoxy and Russian Catholicism. The alliance is clear, but it's not stopping there. The Pope's new dream of a united Europe, a family and a community that he controls. He's going to be, of course, the mother of Parliament. So he's asked all member states of the European Union to adopt the policies of Rome. Look at the date, only a few weeks ago. Things are moving dramatically. And as well as that, the start of this year, the Australian came out of full-page article, Evil at the Heart of Russia. That was talking about Mr. Putin. President Putin is manoeuvring to have himself installed as ruler for life in Russia. Nor is the EU likely to do more than mutter as Putin glues himself to the throne. So there we can see it. Start of this year. But it hasn't stopped there. He had a huge election in Russia this year. What he wanted to do is to come into power till he was 83 years of age. He won with a landslide of victory. Actually, his name was not even in the voting papers. It was deceptive, really. But he won. He got that power. But now he's being even more deceptive. Look at this. Vladimir Putin to step down due to a rumour. He's got Parkinson's disease, they say, a rumour. Look at the bottom. Russian legis legislation proposed could grant ex-presidents lifetime immunity from criminal prosecution. So he thinks he can safely stand down. Is that what he's intending? I don't believe at all. And I'll show you clear evidence of that. Look at that. Daniel chapter 8, verse 25. It's actually worth reading the verse before and afterwards. By his cunning, he shall make deceit to prosper under his hand, and in his own mind he shall become great without warning. He shall destroy many, and he shall even rise up against the prince of princes, and he shall be broken, but by no hand. So he's going to deceive the world. And indeed, this will be the case. You think, if everybody thinks he's got an illness like this, 
they will go to sleep, so to speak, and at the critical moment he will act. Already he's very upset. The leader plans to make Hagia Sophia, which was a church built many, many years ago, into a mosque, and it sparked anger in Russia. A threat against Hagia Sophia is a threat to our spiritual spirituality and history, said the religious leader of Russia. What could happen to Hagia Sophia will cause deep pain among the Russian people, and they are concerned. And already Russia is moving. You see, Russia is going to have to move against Israel. And so what's going to happen? Yes, united with Europe. It hasn't united yet, but it looks that way, doesn't it? Well, let's move on. Again, coming back at the start of this year, Putin said this. Vladimir Putin is set to lead Russia politically for the rest of his life and he's warning at the same time of a catastrophic Middle Eastern war in the near future. He said that. And what has he done? Well, America is moving out of the Middle East. They don't like the hospitals there. And if their people get, their soldiers get coronavirus, they could die. So they're saying, come home. They're bringing out a huge number of troops. Trump is fulfilling his promise to do that. And they're pulling them out. The building that you see on the left was an American base. It was just blown up so nobody else could have it. On the right-hand side, it showed where soldiers were. They've been taken, most of them, out of the Middle East. And Russia is already moving up to take the void. So what's Russia doing? Well, one thing, not going into the Middle East yet, as far as this PowerPoint's concerned, Putin came to the power... Again, 2nd of July. On July the 4th, that's not what this article is saying, but on July the 4th, they moved a large quantity of troops, best trained troops, MiG fighters, short tactical missiles into the area of Armenia. Down into that area there, the House of Tagama, that area, Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, is the area of Tagama. Border hostilities may harm Israel's oil supplies, says the Jerusalem Post. Russia moved in. A thousand odd troops provoked war. Fighting took place. About a thousand, two thousand people lost their life in the fighting. And then they moved another two thousand troops into the area of Armenia and brought peace. But why? Well, Debka, the Israeli paper, said they are threatening to take Turkey. Well, that's possibly true. But it went on to say the first thing they could do, though, is switch off 40% of Israel's oil that comes through that green pipeline. So you can see a critical situation. Israel's got plenty of natural gas, but no oil. And so things are moving. But Brother Thomas said in Eureka that we don't have to wait for Russia to take Constantinople before Christ comes. We have not to wait the advance of the Russian Gog against Constantinople. In Elpis Israel, he thought it was the other way. But later on, many years later, he said, no, Constantinople or Turkey will fall after Christ returns. So what's going to happen? Well, as Russia will be allied with Persia or Iran. It certainly is. What's going on there? Well, dramatic events are taking place. Notice the picture on the right. There's Mr. Trump. Only a few weeks ago, he proposed attacking Iran. There he's sitting before his military leaders. The president was dissuaded from moving ahead with a strike by advisors. Why should they move on Iran? Well, Iran has said when Trump came to power and the deal, the trade treaty with Iran was lifted, we've got 12 times more uranium than we're supposed to have. We can build atom bombs easily. And as well as that, we've got the centrifuges running. And here's where one of them is. 
And now the paper is saying if Trump's not going to do it, maybe Israel will strike Iran in the new, near future. Israel will not accept a hostile state having the most destructive weapons on earth, says the world's Israel News. Well, Israel may have already acted. Here was the th third place that got blown up this year. Underground, don't take the top picture, but underground was nuclear facilities at a place called Natanz. And somehow they blew up and they think Israel did it. It was the third attack into Iran, an air for a missile base. 23 kilometres outside, Iran blew up. The shockwave went right across the city of Tehran. Well, what's going to happen? Well, Israel is going to dwell safely, the margins more correct, confidently. It's not going to really be safe. We know that. Well, Israel has already got laser beams that are 100% accurate. They have got missiles. Um, a few months ago, Russia brought down S-400 missiles and put them on the borders of Israel and said to Israel, don't you fly across our border again. If so, we'll shoot you down. Well, Israel phoned up Greece. Greece had bought the S-400 missiles. They said to Greece, switch off the missile, switch on the radar. Keep that on. They phoned up the next day. They said, had you seen us fly over? No, you didn't fly over. Okay, thank you very much. And the next day, Israel, or well, next night, Israel flew into, into Syria and hit 20 Iranian bases. The Russians wrapped up the missiles, sent them back to Russia and said, they've got to be upgraded. They don't work on the Jews. Iran attacked them with a cyber attack. It didn't get blocked it. Well, Strat 4 says, I should have put this a little higher up. Israel, uh, Israel is not, Israeli planes are not seen on Russian radar. Anyhow, enough said. Israel then cyber attacked the port at the headwaters of the Persian Gulf. There it is. And they attacked it for a whole week. The whole city ground to halt. They got pictures on the web, or did have, of traffic lights red on every side, traffic jams everywhere for a whole week. The whole city ground to a halt. Now, he is the leader of the nuclear development. The chief Iranian nuclear scientist was killed a week or so ago. There's his car. It seems that Israel put a truck inside Israel, inside Iran with guns on board and somehow from a satellite triggered that and killed him. They would stop there. Who knows if it's Israel? Israel says, would we do a thing like that? But it looks like it. And here we are, only a few days ago, the Russian guard commander was killed in Iraq. Notice the words, the apparent of which Ashton are able to target Iranian figures, both abroad and at home, is an acute embarrassment to the Iranian government. Well, it's a warning. Don't be silly in what you're doing. But, of course, they're foolishly preparing for war. And other people are terrified. Other nations are fearful. Here we can see Bahrain, United Arab Emirates, are uniting with Israel because they can see that only Israel can protect them. America's pulling out. So the Abraham Accords formed. And here's a few more. Sudan's joined up. And only today, Morocco's are join, joined up. Nations are very, very afraid. And they believe that the only country that can defend them against Iranian missiles carrying atomic bombs is Israel. So they're joining up with Israel. Amazing. Well, we probably know this quite well. Ezekiel 37 has six steps to Christ's return. The first four we've seen happen right through till I will make them one nation in the land, 1948. 
And now it states that they must, let's go back, that they must take the mountains of Israel. All right? One nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel. Well, let's come back one. Will it go back? Israel has now settled nearly a half a million people in the West Bank. And now with the changing attitude of many of the Arab countries, it looks like Israel may get control of it. Netanyahu says we want it. He said we'll have it by July, but of course he didn't do that. Trouble came his way. But however, it may well happen. And if that's the case, one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel, the next step, one king shall be king to them all. Brethren and sisters, we've got to be prepared. We've got to be walking in that right way. In these last days, the time is super short. Well, now, what so far? Well, 2015, into that area came Russia. We expected that. A brother who, right back in the days of 1941, Brother Sully, I think it was, Co uh, Colliver, Brother Colliver, wrote that a prophecy in Daniel chapter 7 demands that Christ will, uh, Russia will move in 2015. And exactly on time, it moved into the Middle East. Isaiah 17 says, Damascus will be left a ruinous heap. Well, not all of it's like that yet, but indeed much of it is ruinous. And now, Russia has even gone further than that and has built 2017 a massive military base 85 kilometres from the borders of Israel and now they have got soldiers in the Golan Heights on the borders of Israel. Between them and Israel is the United Nations troops and they are at the moment coming from Australia and Fiji. Amazing. But anyhow, there's Russia on the borders of Israel. And they haven't stopped there. Look at that. Russia transports large numbers of tanks to Syria this year. Ships have been going through the Bosphorus, one after another, into Syria. There's one ship carrying 150 tanks and armoured personnel carriers. It's going through the Bosphorus. You can see Turkey in the background. All right? And so... Russia's invasion of Egypt's going to have to take place. We know what the quote says. He'll stretch forth his hand also upon the countries and the land of Egypt shall not escape, but he shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver and over the precious things of Egypt. Libyan and the Ethiopian shall be at his steps. Well, that quote says to us that Russia will invade Egypt for a financial reason. That's interesting. Well, let's first of all take the point of Libya. Russia's big diplomacy, say Turkey, Russia, Egypt, square off over Libya. Now Russia is controlling Libya. Why do they want Libya? Well, out of Libya comes a lot of oil from Europe. Remember, they control the oil and natural gas to Germany. Now they control the oil going through as of Armenia. And Nagorno-Karabakh, after that war we, that's taken place this year, and now they've gone and built military naval bases in Ethiopia and Sudan. Now, that's the territory of the ancient Kush, all right? So here we are. They announced only this week Russia is in a position to close the Red Sea, stopping Saudi Arabia, well, they didn't say that, this is my words, exporting oil with, na with naval ports in Kush, Kush, Ethiopia, and Sudan. So here they've got a base, notice in Ethiopia, and another one in Sudan. There's the photographs of the ships arriving in Sudan this week. And so we can see the Red Sea can be closed off on the southern side by Russia. Now, where does Europe get the rest of its oil? Out of Saudi Arabia, like this. It's pumped through that pipeline, sent by ships through the Suez Canal. Now, what's going on there? 
Well, first of all, come a little aside. Notice October the 22nd, only a few days ago, Israel and the United Emirates strike an oil pipeline deal. Okay, so what's going to happen? Well, the United Arab Emirates brings its pie oil now through Israel. There's a tanker arriving at Elat port, it's unloaded and shipped by a pipeline that goes from Elat to Ashkelon, then loaded aboard tankers into Europe. Ah, so oil can go through there. But Russia doesn't want that until Europe is subject to them. Well, let's talk about Egypt first. Soko summit hits growing Russian-Egyptian ties. Late last year, Putin went down to Russia, to Egypt, at a meeting with 43 African leaders and formed an Egyptian partnership with Russia and established a Suez economic zone, a financial zone, down there. Amazing. And even just only a few weeks ago, sent planes through Africa, just showing, you know, their power. Here's a plane capable of carrying nuclear weapons that landed, a friendly landing, just to show the nice spirit of Russia in South Africa. Incredible, isn't it? So Russia is showing very strongly, Egypt, all of Africa, you do what we want and we'll trade with you. We'll form an economic alliance and we can stop the Suez Canal. Well, brethren and sisters, I'm now going to bring things to a close. I'm sure that you'll have some questions and that will be lovely if I can help you. But come back with me to Isaiah 24. Now, in the middle of Isaiah 24, verses 13 to 16, halfway through verse 16, Brother Mansfield says, we have beautiful words that apply to us today. Why? Well, this is what they say. It says, now, I'll read to you from the ESV as I've got up on the screen. You can follow me with the King James if you like. They lift up their voices. They sing for joy. That's us. Over the majesty of Yahweh. They shout from the west. Therefore in the east. So it's worldwide. They give glory to Yahweh in the coastlands of the sea. They give glory to the name of Yahweh, the God of Israel. From the ends of the earth we hear songs of praise, of glory to the righteous one. What wonderful words. Brother Thomas, Brother Mansfield says, here are the saints at the last minute praising God because they can see Christ is coming. They can see Isaiah 24 is fulfilled. They can see the second half of the Olivet prophecy that Jesus spoke is being fulfilled. They can see those words of Revelation 16, verses 15 and 16 being fulfilled. That love letter of the Lord Jesus Christ to us, calling on us to watch, to be awake, and to keep our garments so that we might be found worthy at that day. Well, brethren and sisters, it's only just around the corner and the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. It's almost here. 